the early morning hours of June 8, 1924, George Mallory, accompanied by Andrew Irvine, began the final stretch of a days-long ascent up the imposing heights of Mount Everest. To date, no human had ever reached its summit, but Mallory intended to be the first. At 12.50 p.m. on the 8th, elsewhere on the mountain, fellow mountaineer Noel O'Dell was conducting a geological survey when he looked up and saw the distant dots of Mallory and Irvine steadily climbing up the mountain, little more than 800 feet from the summit. The dots of the distant explorers continued upward into the clouds, never to be seen again. In the years since, Mount Everest's forbidding slopes have claimed more than 300 lives, and so we might wonder, what compels people to climb this mountain? George Mallory put it rather succinctly in an interview with the New York Times three months before his final climb, when asked, why did you want to climb Mount Everest? Mallory famously replied, because it's there. He elaborated. Everest is the highest mountain in the world, and no man has reached its summit. Its existence is a challenge. The answer is instinctive, a part, I suppose, of man's desire to conquer the universe. I kept thinking about Mallory's words, because it's there, as I was playing through Bethesda Game Studios' Starfield. I am, without question, about as close to the center of Starfield's target demographic as anyone in the world. I adore science fiction. I adore space. My grandfather helped design the Saturn V. I watched the final launch of the space shuttle program from my backyard. I've written two sci-fi novels and a sci-fi novella. I drove three hours to see Interstellar projected on 70mm film. If ever there was a game theoretically crafted to my exact tastes in science fiction, Starfield's marketing campaign sure sold it that way. Calling all explorers, they said. I love games about discovery. I've spent unreasonable amounts of time exploring the interstellar worlds of games like No Man's Sky, Mirror Moon, In Other Waters, and The Outer Wilds. Games that absolutely manifest those same romantic feelings of exploration that George Mallory voiced as he looked out upon the titanic heights of Mount Everest. And so I was more than ready to discover what Starfield had to offer. Starfield's game director Todd Howard described it this way in an interview with Jeff Bezos' Washington Post. When you look up in the sky, there's this drive to know what is out there. Are we alone? What are the origins of space and time and all those things? What role does religion play in some of that as well? So we do get into some big questions, and I think a game like this is a good place to do that. I was ready for big questions. I've looked up to the sky so many times and wondered what's out there. Even just to look up at the moon every night and know people, real human people have walked on it, boggles my mind. But then some 50 hours or so into the game, I completed Starfield's main story and I was transfixed by its emptiness. I spent another 30 hours searching for some deeper meaning behind the story of Starfield, even stumbling into an achievement for visiting all of Starfield's star systems, but all I found was more emptiness. And so it was while staring down the barrel of this emptiness that, unsure of how else to process my feelings, I sat down at my computer and began to write to try to dissect why I felt this way. And it really comes down to two big things. How Starfield's role-playing system's great against the progression of the main story, and the themes and subtext of the story itself. But before we can dive into any of that, we first need to know, what exactly is the story of Starfield? Well, our adventure begins deep within the crust of some desolate rock or another where you're tasked to go dig up some weird thing another mining crew found embedded in a cave wall. You do just that and are greeted with a colorful, frenetic vision of something. Is the vision literal, a location in deep space, or is the texture of it hinting at some deeper meaning? We don't know, but there are other folks in space who'd like to find out. Enter. Constellation, an interstellar collection of explorers who've already found a few other artifacts just like yours, and they'd like to send you off to find the rest of them. 
And so, you embark on this quest to unravel this cosmic mystery, and on your way you discover that you're not the only one hunting for these artifacts. There are other, more powerful beings, not from this world, that seek to take the artifacts for themselves. These beings are the Starborn, interdimensional travelers who each, at one point or another, collected within their own reality their own collection of artifacts and assembled them into a portal leading to a singularity called the Unity. Though they were each once human, passing through the Unity made these explorers starborn, and set them off on a cyclical quest to emerge into a new reflection of the universe, collect all that universe's artifacts, and pass through the Unity again, until such a time as they tire of their quest and settle in whatever pocket of the multiverse they feel is worth stopping. And so your quest becomes a journey to find the rest of the artifacts before the Starborn do, so you can become Starborn yourself. At the end of your journey, you arrive at the Unity and enter into a new universe. That is the story in the broadest strokes of Starfield. And that is the story in which I found nothing but emptiness. When I began writing this script, I set out with the goal of not addressing the more specific game design of Starfield, because I'm not a game dev and that's not my area of expertise. I'm a writer, and I hoped that I would just be able to focus on the storytelling elements of Starfield so as to not engage in the sin of armchair game development. But as we've already said, Starfield, unlike most films, stage plays, novels, and music, is a form of interactive fiction, and so the nature of its storytelling is inextricably bound to the systems by which the players are able to interact with that fiction. So you'll forgive me the briefest moment here in which I'll talk about the game design of Starfield in the context of its storytelling. Starfield, as with most of Bethesda Game Studios' contemporary gameography, falls under the umbrella of role-playing games, or games in which the player is given some amount of agency to play the game as they'd like to play it, and participate in the story in potentially a completely different way from every other player. Starfield, like many other games in this subgenre, allows players a variety of options in how to play the game, from character backgrounds, to specific skills, to specific dialogue options, to even the order in which they play through the game's myriad story threads. And that freedom was a big part of how the game was pitched, the ability to be whatever kind of character you wanted to be. Todd Howard even explicitly pitched it this way in Bethesda's Starfield Direct on June 11th, 2023. And throughout all that time, we'd often talk about and dream up the space game. What if we could take that feeling of being who you want to be and exploring a new world, but set it in space, where you weren't really limited in where you could go or what you could do? And that is Starfield. Now, I approach role-playing games the same way I approach theatrical performance. I'm playing a character. I know that the character creator component in games like Starfield has its roots in tabletop role-playing games, but in the world of the performance arts, the process of creating a character is very similar. Defining your character's background, their interests, history, and goals. And those decisions will inform how I play my character's role from there on out. Key then to the creation of my character in Starfield was choosing a background in xenobiology. I'd recently played through Black Salt Games' Dredge, recently replayed In Other Waters, and after spending far too much time fishing and gardening in Star Wars Jedi Survivor, I was thrilled at the prospect of playing a character who could just wander across distant planets to categorize and taxonomize all the local flora and fauna. I knew the main story would likely be much more action-packed than that, but even so, when I first stepped into Starfield, I was excited by the prospects of what my background in xenobiology might offer and I aimed to filter as many character interactions as I could through this lens. However, almost immediately I discovered that the way I wanted to play Starfield was decidedly not the way Starfield wanted me to play. The few times that Starfield's main story did cause me to cross paths with local fauna, it forced me to indiscriminately gun them down. And that made me sad. I knew it wouldn't immediately be this way, but I hoped that after increasing my xenobiology skills it might become like the Animal Friend perk in Fallout, and Starfield's alien creatures would be, at worst, neutral to my presence, and at best, actual allies in my adventures. 
I understand also that this assumption on my part does not constitute a failure on Bethesda's, but you'll excuse me for making that assumption given Bethesda's pedigree with their Fallout games. As said then, my few encounters with aggressive alien creatures never ended peacefully. In fact, one of the rare times I was able to prompt special dialogue with my xenobiology background was late in the main story, where I was able to correctly identify a specific alien species, though this identification was only in service of asking the security officer overseeing this overrun outpost if he had a bigger gun I could use to kill the invading creatures. All this to say, were Starfield a game in which the player did have absolute and complete freedom over how they played, an impossible ask I understand, but certainly a picture the game's marketing attempted to paint. My character would not have participated in the events of the main story beyond those first introductory moments, for the simple reason that the character I wanted to roleplay would have had no interest in furthering the goals of Constellation as they related to the gathering of these alien artifacts. In theatrical performance, we're always talking about the motivation of our characters. What is making me do what the words on the page tell me my character is supposed to do and supposed to say? It is of the utmost importance for the actor to find a believable motivation, otherwise their performance will ring false to an audience. But acting is certainly not the only subject of artistic expression concerned with motivation. In the world of cinematography, we talk about motivated and unmotivated camera movement. And in writing, we want to make sure that we have motivated reasons for moving the story from beat to beat. Much has been said by people smarter than I am about Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces, in which Campbell explores the idea of the monomyth, or colloquially, the hero's journey. Campbell outlines a 17-point structure that many of these hero's journey stories follow, but for the sake of what we're talking about, I want to focus on just the first two points, which Campbell calls the call to adventure and the refusal of the call. A widely known example in contemporary fiction employing this structure is George Lucas' original 1977 Star Wars film, where when Luke first meets Obi-Wan and reveals to him the message from Princess Leia, Obi-Wan says, you must learn the ways of the Force, if you're to come with me to Alderaan. But Luke cites prior obligations to the family farm as a reason he can't go with Obi-Wan to Alderaan, and he even tells Obi-Wan that even though he hates the Empire too, there's nothing he can do about it right now. It's only after that farm is destroyed by the Empire that he asks Obi-Wan to train him in the ways of the Force. The killing of Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru makes the fight of the Rebellion personal to Luke, and provides him with the motivation to follow Obi-Wan off-world. But in Starfield, my character was provided with no such motivation. It was as though all the other characters in the story knew where the story was headed, and, like George Mallory, wanted to pursue the thread of the main quest because it's there. And while conceptually the romantic notion behind Because It's There might be an interesting jumping off point for a game ostensibly all about exploration and peeling back the curtain of the unknown, this feeling ended up being far too weak a personal motivation for participating in that story's events. Throughout the main quest, I was repeatedly arriving at the refusal of the call portion of my own story. The most frustrating of these moments came the first time the Starborn revealed themselves to me. I'd been traveling with Walter Stroud, the billionaire owner of one of Starfield's in-universe shipyards, and I'd, only after exhausting literally every other available option, shot up the offices of a rival aerospace corporation to abscond with an artifact that they'd recovered. So already I was in a bad mood. Were I truly free to play as I wanted, my xenobiologist player character, when it became clear violence would be the only way of retrieving this artifact, would have walked away from the quest right there, and left Walter holding the bag on Neon. But violence was had, and then out in orbit another ship jumped in, and told me that these artifacts didn't belong to me. I did not yet know that this ship belonged to a once human, so for all I knew, this ship was from whatever race of people originally built the artifacts. And I was thrilled to see there was a dialogue option in which I could surrender my ill-gotten artifact to this mysterious ship. Finally, I thought to myself, I can play the way I want, and I was excited to see what narrative implications this choice would have. But this choice didn't prompt any meaningful change. Walter Stroud, the billionaire still riding shotgun with me, refused to let me give up the artifact. Don't be a f 
If the artifacts were theirs, why would some of them be embedded under layers of rock? The only thing we know for certain is that the artifacts are important. We can't just give that away. The Starborn jumped away, and we returned to Constellation, and I felt even worse than before. And by the time Starfield revealed itself to be a multiverse tale, I was well and truly disinterested in continuing Constellation's pursuit of these artifacts. And time and again, Starfield refused to provide me with even one substantial reason to enthusiastically participate in its story. Its characters, like Walter before, dismissed my refusals outright, and dragged me by the hand through the ever-unfolding story until even the mere implication of refusal vanished from any potential dialogue options, and I was made a hostage of Starfield's narrative systems. And so I completed Starfield's story as my xenobiologist cosplayed as a stone-cold explorer, without a care in the world except to deny these other Starborn their claim to the Unity. And then I met myself at the end of the universe, and myself asked me if I had any regrets. I had so many, but then I passed through the Unity, and I did, against all odds, learn something about this universe. I learned that Starfield is not about anything. It may seem unnecessary to explain, but what do we mean when we talk about the theme of a work of fiction? Well, theme is, at a basic level, what a story is about. Not the literal events of the story, but what those events mean. Robocop is a story about a police officer who dies in the line of duty and is brought back as a cyborg. But Robocop is about the unholy union of private corporations and public institutions, and about how corporate greed often overpowers public good. Interstellar is a story about a group of astronauts who venture through a wormhole to try to find a habitable world for humanity, but it's about forming unbreakable bonds with the people we love. Godzilla is a movie about a giant lizard that attacks Tokyo, but it's about the horror of the United States nuclear attacks against Japan. A true theme is not a word, but a sentence. One clear, coherent sentence that expresses a story's irreducible meaning. That's how writer Robert McKee describes theme. However, in his seminal work on the art of screenwriting, the succinctly titled Story, McKee argues that the word theme has become a bit too unclear in recent years, and so he uses the phrase controlling idea. The controlling idea of a completed story must be expressible in a single sentence. A story becomes a kind of living philosophy that the audience members grasp as a whole, in a flash without conscious thought. A perception married to their life experiences. What then are the themes, or the controlling ideas, of Starfield? It was just after the reveal that the story of Starfield took place within a multiverse that I recalled an essay by Stanislaw Lem. If you're part of Starfield's target demographic like me, you're likely already quite familiar with the name. But for those of you who might not be as familiar, Stanislaw Lem was a Polish science fiction author most famous for works like Eden, Solaris, and The Invincible, the latter of which is set to get its own video game adaptation later this year year. But Lem was also a prolific essayist, often writing about science fiction and the state of it. The essay that popped into my head as I was playing through Starfield's main story was one from 1970 titled On the Structural Analysis of Science Fiction. In the essay, amongst many other points, Lem outlines two kinds of science fiction that he calls real science fiction and pseudoscience fiction. Lem's taxonomy, though, of real science fiction is not a value judgment, but rather a way of describing the content of the work. We might call this today hard science fiction. Stories that, in Lem's words, deal with subjects that can be interpreted empirically and rationally. Real science fiction has no inexplicable marvels, no transcendencies, no devils or demons, and the pattern of occurrences must be verisimilar. It's by breaking these rules, Lem states, that one slips into the realm of pseudoscience fiction. He cites Franz Kafka's The Metamorphosis as an example of this form, in which the protagonist of the novella awakens one morning to find they've become a giant bug. 
In this form of science fiction, the writing becomes concerned not with the reality of the situation, like whether or not such a transformation could actually occur to a human being, but focuses instead on the subtext of the transformation, or what Lem calls the content to be signaled. What truth can we as readers derive from the fact that this man has turned into a bug? Lem goes on then to describe a pitfall into which he'd observed many science fiction authors of the 60s fall, but I think that as we read through his words you'll agree they have just as much validity today as they did when he wrote them more than 50 years ago. As in life, we can solve real problems with the help of images of non-existent beings. So in literature, can we signal the existence of real problems with the help of prima facie impossible occurrences or objects? Even when the happenings it describes are totally impossible, a science fiction work may still point out meaningful, indeed rational, problems. For example, the social, psychological, political, and economic problems of space travel may be depicted quite realistically in science fiction, even though the technological parameters of the spaceships described are quite fantastic in the sense that it will, for all eternity, be impossible to build a spaceship with such parameters. But what if everything in a science fiction work is fantastic? What if not only the objects, but also the problems have no chance of ever being realized? As as when impossible time travel machines are used to point out impossible time travel paradoxes. In such cases, science fiction is playing an empty game. Four years prior to Lem's On the Structural Analysis of Science Fiction, science fiction author and editor Judith Merrill wrote an essay for extrapolation titled What Do You Mean, Science Fiction? in which she outlined three forms of sci-fi, which she called teaching stories, preaching stories, and speculative fiction. By Merrill's definitions, teaching stories come about when the fiction form is utilized to present a new scientific idea because there are social, political, religious, or academic pressures operating against it. Preaching stories are primarily allegories and satires, morality pieces, prophecies, visions, and warnings more concerned with the conduct of human society than with its techniques. And works of speculative fiction are stories whose objective is to explore, to discover, to learn something about the nature of the universe, of man, or of reality. By a blend of Lem and Merrill's definitions, we can say then that Starfield is speculative pseudoscience fiction. It's certainly aiming to reveal something about the nature of the universe, or of man, or of reality, but it is doing so with an assortment of fantastic mechanisms and plot devices that are without a doubt, by Lem's standard, inexplicable marvels. But it's the way this story employs its narrative devices that lead me to the conclusion that Starfield is ultimately, as Lem says, an empty game. Since empty games have no hidden meaning, since they represent nothing and predict nothing, they have no relationship at all to the real world and can therefore please us only as logical puzzles, as paradoxes, as intellectual acrobatics. Their value is autonomous because they lack all semantic reference. Lem was lamenting a specific kind of writer that had popped up in the 60s, writers who were so excited to finally be able to play with the tools of science fiction's toolbox that they forgot you could actually use those elements to construct something meaningful. At least as far as the main narrative of Starfield is concerned, Bethesda has crafted a tale in which they're using the aesthetics and textures of a colorful sci-fi palette to paint a pretty picture of the future, but one that ultimately has nothing to say about, as Merrill put it, the nature of the universe, of man, or of reality. When Starfield introduced its multiverse, I groaned, in part because of the seeming ubiquity of the concept within the fiction of the past few years of mass market entertainment, but also because there is, by the very nature of the multiverse, a built-in undercutting of stakes. For example, just before the story beat in which I discovered Starfield was a multiverse story, I was told that the Starborn were about to attack Constellation's base in New Atlantis, and Constellation's space station in orbit around Jemison. I was given a choice about which place to defend, and I chose the space station. As a consequence, when I returned to New Atlantis, I found that Sarah Morgan, the de facto leader of Constellation to that point, had died in defense of the Lodge. And yet it was Sarah Morgan who revealed to me minutes later that this universe was just one of many. A Sarah Morgan from another one of these universes. 
You see the trouble here. The potential pain of Sarah's death in my universe was immediately undercut, because here is another version of her. Different, yes, from a technical perspective, but for all textural purposes, the same. This endless pool of potential variations of the same character is one of the reasons I've found myself so unattached to the storytelling of the Marvel Cinematic Universe post-Avengers Endgame. When any character can be pulled out of another world to replace the same character in this one, who cares who lives and who dies? When everyone can be replaced, who we lose doesn't matter. But perhaps I thought to myself I was being too death of the author about this. Just because I didn't get something out of the story doesn't mean that the authors didn't include some deeper meaning within it. In truth, even when I do find deeper meanings in stories, I do like to seek out the author's original intentions, if for no other reason than to satisfy my own curiosities and to know whether or not the authors were, by my observation, successful in what they set out to do. To this end, I read a lot of interviews with the creative team behind Starfield, and I was a bit surprised by what I found. I was most struck by two interviews with Starfield's lead designer, Emile Pagliarulo, one with Polygon and one with NPR. In the Polygon article, Pagliarulo seemed much more interested in explicitly exploring the cosmology of the world of Starfield, and how, if at all, its inhabitants, and by proxy us as the player, might find God, or not find God, out there amongst the stars, saying that, we really wanted to dig into the sort of high-level stuff with exploring space, the more theological aspects of it. And so we would have a lot of talks on our own journeys, our own theology. You know, what is out there? There's the atheist view, there's the more agnostic, religious view, but we don't answer that question for the player. We don't say what's out there or what's causing their thing. It's open to interpretation. Players have gotten other things before, the science, the exploration, meeting the alien race that wants to invade. Those are all great, I love those things, but we wanted to know if we could tackle a bit of a larger story in a game. The real high level of the story is like, are we alone in the universe in one place? What is the meaning of the universe? Constellation is still pushing the boundaries. They want to know what's out there. They want to know about the weird things that they're finding. What are they all about? Where do they come from? No one else seems to care. No one else seems to know the extent of what's going on, but everyone else is squabbling. And no one's concerned with exploring. This mirrored Todd Howard's interview with the Washington Post, though Todd's response was, to my mind, a pretty boilerplate answer in regards to the creation of any big sci-fi project, touching on ideas like the human urge to explore, and existential ideas like our place in the universe. But nothing about Todd's answer indicated to me that he had any particular reason to explore any of these ideas. He was just asking the questions, and not providing any perspective on their potential answers. You prefer answers that do not require you to commit to a position. I find this curious. But Pagliarulo seemed far more eager to actually dig into those ideas to see what meaning could be pulled from them. In his interview with NPR, Pagliarulo described the big ideas in Starfield in similar but slightly more succinct and slightly more human terms. When you look at the model of the universe and all the galaxies, and then you feel so insignificant, but then you look at your life and how significant you are to the people that you love, it puts things into an interesting perspective. So from Pagliarulo's perspective, Starfield is intended to be about exploring the universe in order to find its meaning, or at the very least, our personal meaning within it. But is that clear enough? Is it well-defined enough amidst all the different stuff packed into Starfield's myriad solar systems? McKee warns, The more beautifully you shape your work around one clear idea, the more meanings audiences will discover in your story as they take your idea and follow its implications into every aspect of their lives. Conversely, the more ideas you try to pack into a story, the more they implode upon themselves, until the story collapses into a rubble of tangential notions saying nothing. Throughout its narrative, Starfield frames this exploration as not just something we might want to do, but something we have to do. Once you've discovered that first artifact and bring it back to Constellation, it quickly becomes obvious that your artifact is just a small part of a greater whole, whose purpose and function has yet to be revealed. The search for these artifacts is not something it would be nice to do, but something the people of Constellation, and by proxy the player, have to do. As I said earlier, I could not refuse this call. I was dragged along by it, despite trying at every moment to stop. 
And then, when we get to the reveal that these artifacts form the rings of an armillary sphere, and that sphere leads to a focal point of all space and time called the Unity, the only perspective Starfield seems to have is, hey, aren't parallel dimensions cool? Isn't it cool to be able to explore different versions of these worlds? Peter Moorhead, developer of indie games Stranded and Murder and the upcoming Upon the Winds of Distant Suns, said it well in a September 10, 2023 post on the platform formerly known as Twitter. I think Starfield's biggest narrative issue might actually be that there's too little ideology in it. Nearly 10 hours deep and I couldn't tell you a damn thing about the politics or worldview of the main factions. There is no deeper meaning to the revelation of the unity. Even when set against the backdrop of Starfield's main theme of exploration as a kind of moral imperative, in the end we aren't using the Unity to do anything other than explore. We're just exploring for exploration's sake. This feeling was hammered home when, during my wanderings in New Game Plus, I encountered another Starborn. Not one of the ones who was fighting me for the artifact, but one who seemed to have grown tired of the grind, and had finally stopped in this reality to live out the rest of their life in peace. They told me that... But after all the pain, suffering, and just mind-boggling effort, I was left wondering, why bother? And that's the question I kept asking myself. What is the point of all this repetition, apart from being some intellectual exercise in exploring the subtle differences that might manifest between copies of the universe? There's even a contradiction between Starfield's desire to push further into the unknown and the reveal that it was this exact desire that killed the Earth. Some two-thirds of the way through the main quest, you'll begin a mission entitled Unearthed. In this mission, you'll visit the moon and a long-abandoned NASA facility in Florida, where you discover that the technology for grav drives, which have allowed humankind to expand into Starfield's settled systems, was derived from one of the alien artifacts you've been searching for. But not enough study was done on those initial versions of this technology, and the gravity waves from all the test flights and other early explorations of nearby worlds eventually sheared away the Earth's magnetosphere, rendering the planet uninhabitable. By pushing ourselves further into the cosmos, we killed off our home and forced ourselves to stay out in the cold darkness. And yet all throughout the game we're told, we have to do this, we have to find more artifacts, we have to reach the unity. Even after we learned that it was this exact hubris that killed the Earth. Never once after learning this information does anyone question the further collection of these artifacts, even if you, the player, choose those dialogue boxes. Constellation's answer is always the same. You cannot stop searching. You cannot stop the quest. I have to return now to the writings of Stanislaw Lem to hopefully bring this far too long video to a close. I want to look at another of Lem's essays, this time from 1977, titled Cosmology in Science Fiction. The essay begins with Lem remarking on the 1973 issue of Cosmology Now, and how the advancements of the scientific community's understanding of astrological phenomena contained therein seemed to have eluded or been ignored by the science fiction authors of the day. Though Lem laments that this split between science fiction authors and the broader world of contemporary science began much earlier than 1973, when sci-fi authors acquired, in Lem's words, two fantastic, very convenient inventions, unlimited travel in time and faster than light travel in space. Lem wrote that, Thanks to time travel and speeds faster than light, the cosmos has acquired such qualities as domesticate it in an exemplary manner for storytelling purposes but at the same time, it has lost its strange, icy sovereignty. Lem goes on to outline myriad scientific discoveries and theories that he laments will never be explored by contemporary science fiction writers, though I'd be remiss to not note that many 21st century authors have, in many instances, done admirably to prove Lem's pessimistic vision of the future of sci-fi dead wrong, and notes that... Science fiction criticism often talks of a sense of wonder that the field is supposed to generate, but upon a close examination that wonder divulges its close relationship to the tricks of a stage magician. As popular fiction, science fiction must pose artificial problems and offer their easy solution. The astonishing problems of contemporary cosmology, which border on paradox, are of no use to the science fiction writers 
because they cannot be tucked into the narrow frame of the artificial cosmos. Any comparison, including that with the stage magician, isn't quite exact. The magician doesn't aim at anything beyond the production of some tricks, whereas the self-imprisonment that is characteristic of science fiction has made it unable to describe real space anymore. Unfortunately, I think the storytelling in Starfield falls into this narrow, self-imprisoned camp of sci-fi storytelling. In the universe of science fiction, there is not the slightest chance that genuine myths and theologies might arise, because the thing itself is a bastard of myths gone to the dogs. The science fiction of today resembles a graveyard of gravity, in which that subgenre of literature that promised the cosmos to mankind dreams away its defeat in onanistic delusions and chimeras. The task of the science fiction author of today is as easy as that of the pornographer, and in the same way. Now that all the real stops to the satisfaction of their impulses have been pulled, they can have their fling. But with the stops has disappeared the indescribable richness that can be conveyed only by real life. Where anything comes easy, nothing can be of value. The most inflamed desire must finally end up in miserable dullness. I am confident in saying that the story of Starfield is, regrettably, one of Bethesda's weakest. For me, that weakness manifested in the form of an absolutely weightless narrative that struggles to say anything meaningful about the world in which it takes place, or about our world in the here and now. And in those few moments where it does try to pull some deeper meaning from its text, it often does so in ways that contradict previously established themes, ending, as Lem said, in miserable dullness. Sci-fi artist Roger Dean once said about minimalism in graphic design that it was an art form that had been caught and tamed and made corporate. And that's what Bethesda has done to the multiverse with Starfield. It has taken the potentially high stakes concept of multiple realities and time loops and caught them, tamed them, and made them corporate in an effort to make a game that can be all things to all people. You cannot take your new knowledge and save the Earth from being asphyxiated by the grav drive. You cannot bring back to life the members of your party that have died helping you reach your goals. You can only move on to the next universe. You can make new choices, but those choices won't reverse the ones you've made previous. Those sins will remain with you. The unity does not absolve you. And so the only reason we're left with to explore the universe of Starfield is because it's there, and that's just not enough. Hello, Waffle. Are you coming up here? <gasps> Hello, boy. Hi, buddy. Yeah, so that was about 7,000 words for what I could have just said in four. I didn't like Starfield. But um, I wanted to tack on this unscripted epilogue. Because I wanted to make sure, though it likely doesn't come across this way at any point up until now, that um, on the micro level, I did enjoy a lot of the narrative stuff in Starfield, especially the kind of the offshoot side missions. The whole UC Crimson Fleet quest line through when you get captured with the contraband through, I think the last mission is called Legacy's End. Going down into the lock, I thought it had a very cool kind of Stargate SG-1 kind of vibe. And then doing the heist on the luxury cruise had kind of like a fifth element vibe to it. I liked Operation Starseed, where you go and you meet all the clones. I liked the, I can't remember what the mission is called, but basically where you go to like the space halfway house and uh, there's the conflict between the construction workers and the former convicts and you find out there are these rogue bounty hunters that are trying to take down the whole place and I was able to resolve it peacefully with my persuasion skills I was able to get the bounty hunters to back off even though there was somewhat an ironic moment at the end of that whole story thread where I went and then I met with the wealthy benefactor who was funding this whole place and she was like thank you for resolving this situation peacefully Here's a gun. I still, I, I liked that a lot. But then I just had a couple other thoughts in closing I wanted to get through as I was reminded of stuff going and capturing more B-roll. I have just spent many thousands of words uh, talking about how Starfield doesn't really have a point of view on anything, including the morality of the player character. Whatever you were before, or whatever you do once you're out there, I don't care. So long as you don't bring UC security to our doorstep. Every member of Constellation is their own conscience. 
Those are the rules. Advance humanity's knowledge to the best of your ability. As long as you do that, I'm not here to judge you. I know why it's there. It's telling all the players who would want to roleplay as a strictly evil character that they'll be allowed to do that and the game's not going to penalize them for it. But it just comes across as a very odd framing of the game's narrative, given that it's kind of couched in this whole kind of space Indiana Jones motif where I'm married to a museum educator and there's been a lot of talk in the museum space for the past few years or so about the ethics of what museums have what and talk of like repatriating or matriating artifacts back to the cultures that they belong to. With that all in mind, it just seemed very strange that Sarah would explicitly tell you, the player character, that this is an ends justify the means type of game, that you can do whatever you want, just so long as you get these artifacts and you unravel the mystery. And I thought that taking this ends justify the means tact was particularly odd in regards to the themes of exploration, going back to the idea that the study of the grav drive, this unguided push into the unknown had these catastrophic effects on the earth and sheared away the magnetosphere and the atmosphere sputtered out and now earth is totally uninhabitable and that oddly got me thinking about another piece of storytelling from 2023 which was christopher nolan's oppenheimer which similarly was about this this push into the unknown and a furthering of scientific understanding that led to this consequence of this thing that could and likely will destroy us. But unlike Starfield, Oppenheimer is taking the stance of, oh yeah, this is truly a Pandora's box that has been opened and we are gonna have to deal with the fallout of this for the rest of our lives. And I thought it would have been interesting if if Starfield had, had explored that a little bit further, this idea that this exploration of the unknown There's this human drive to explore the unknown, to discover, to find out what's out there, but it can destroy us if we're not careful. And so yeah, between that and Sarah's kind of ends justify the means rationalization of future player choices, I just really didn't know what to make of Starfield. So in conclusion, on the micro level, I do think Starfield is capable of of interesting and captivating storytelling but on the macro level it's just all too anemic or at odds with itself to coalesce into a story that i will ever want to revisit or would ever recommend to people yeah so if you liked this video feel free to like and subscribe to Subpixel Team. And please leave a comment because I am really interested to see what people have to think about this. I've been seeing uh, effusive praise for this game on the internet as well as some hyperbolically derogatory reviews. So uh, what do you think? Please let me know in the comments. And uh, yeah, I have been Jake Terrio. This has been another episode of Subpixel Spotlight. Thanks for watching.